We all know the story. Theorising that one could time travel within his own lifetime, Dr. Sam Beckett stepped into the Quantum Leap Accelerator and vanished. He woke to find himself trapped in the past, facing mirror images that weren't his own, and driven by an unknown force to, oh hang on, different Quantum Leap. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCBWay. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCBWay also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. Okay, this quantum leap doesn't involve jumping through time and space or attempting to change history, but it does represent a significant turning point in the history of one of the UK's most successful computer companies, Sinclair Research. The rapid march to seek dominance in the UK micro market had seen Sinclair release the ZX80 in 1980, the ZX81 in 1981, the Spectrum in 1982, in development known as the ZX82 or oddly the ZX81 colour, and had designs on an as yet unnamed machine codenamed ZX83. Now the ZX80 was a quirky little machine and really wasn't very powerful, but it was cheap, being one of the first computers available in the UK for under £100. And in fact, if you weren't afraid of a soldering iron, you could buy the ZX80 in kit form for under £80. Quid. This price point made the machine very popular among hobbyists and over 500,000 of them were sold. The ZX81 had followed suit and expanded on the ZX80 in many ways and was even more popular, selling over 1.5 million units. But it was the ZX82 in its ZX Spectrum guise that launched Sinclair into the home micro stratosphere, selling over 5 million units and creating a legend in the process. And hopes were high for its successor, the ZX83, which had in fact been on the drawing board since 1981, and initial designs had seen the machine as a portable business machine. Ugh. High and mighty aspirations of using an in-house developed flat screen TV, a built-in printer and a built-in modem were culled early in development, probably due to cost and potentially because actually the technology being considered for the screen and printer weren't really much cop. Take a look at the TV80 flat screen TV for an example and anyone who's used a Sinclair thermal printer will probably see the limitations of the device for business use. The project was reimagined as a traditional desktop machine and with a lofty brief in mind, be faster and more powerful than both the IBM PC and the Apple Macintosh, a significant target to aim at, but if Sinclair could just crack that market and get a good slice of that business pie, well, to stand a chance, the specs of the machine had to really stack up. And unfortunately, this is where Sinclair's focus on building down to a cost and not up to a quality would ultimately be their undoing, but that's a little down the line. The industrial design was by Rick Dickinson, who had already designed the ZX81 and Spectrum machines, and with the ZX Spectrum Plus and the now named Quantum Leap, or QL, was bringing in Sinclair's new design aesthetic, which was more sharp-edged, purposeful and all business-like. Now, there's no denying that the Spectrum Plus and the QL both looked amazing, and Sinclair even offered existing rubber key Spectrum owners an opportunity to buy the new Spectrum Plus case to, quote, upgrade their own machines, even though doing so would give you no functional or operational improvements whatsoever, other than a different keyboard. And note, I said different, not necessarily better. So the design was great and the performance goals were set. So what did Sinclair put inside the machine? 
Well, the electronics were designed primarily by David Carlin and started with a Motorola 68008, 32-bit <clears throat> processor. Why the awkward clearing of the throat? Well, the 68008 was a 32-bit processor on the inside, but it only had an 8-bit external data bus and a heavily reduced 1 megabyte address space versus 16 megabyte on the full-blown 68000. So even though the 68008 in the QL was designed to run at a respectable 7.5 megahertz, almost the same as the 68000 in the Macintosh, it actually runs significantly slower than its full 32-bit bigger brother. The machine was designed with 128k of RAM, expandable officially to 640k or an unsupported but possible 896k, which was respectable for the time but would soon seem fairly small potatoes within a couple of years of release. As was becoming increasingly popular in an effort to reduce cost and consolidate functions, the QL had a couple of ULA or uncommitted logic arrays called the ZX8301 and the ZX8302 which were responsible in the case of the 301 for providing the video display, the system clock, memory control and other ancillary functions and in the case of the 302 most of the peripherals and the micro drives. Speaking of microdrives, the QL was furnished with two of them, so that was either double the fun or twice the misery, depending on your experience with the technology, which, let's remember, is essentially a loop of tape being dragged past the read and write heads at speed. More hit than miss, but Sinclair had invested heavily in the technology for its release for the Spectrum and needed to see that investment out and perhaps even truly believed in it. There was an expansion slot, a ROM cartridge slot, dual RS-232 ports, a proprietary LAN port, two joystick ports and an external microdrive bus in case you just couldn't get enough of that tech. Software wise, the QL launched with a suite of business software by Scion and its own proprietary OS QDOS, replacing the original OS choice by GST although this was later made available as an add-on ROM cartridge. That switch out of the OS late in the day unfortunately meant delays and even though Sir Clive Sinclair had been very vocal about the QL's abilities, at the time of the machine's launch, 12th of January 1984, there wasn't a single complete working machine in existence. This didn't stop Sinclair from taking orders for the machine of course and that pre-order offered a machine on your doorstep within 28 days. Well, it was in fact April of 1984 when the first machine started to appear, causing quite a bit of backlash for Sinclair, and this was compounded by the fact that those early machines were, shall we say, Friday afternoon specials. One of the most notable screaming issues was that not all of the machine's newly finished ROM software fitted onto the machine's 32K ROM chip. Early machines were supplied with an additional 16K dongle that contained the remaining code, and the issues didn't stop there. QL Super Basic shipped with numerous bugs, as did the OS itself, and those lovely micro drives also caused issues. Each drive was independently calibrated, which meant software saved onto a cartridge on one machine wouldn't necessarily load on another. All of this created bad press, and despite the machine being fairly advanced and pretty cheap at its launch price of 399 it failed to make any impression on the market. Business folk were drifting heavily to the IBM PC, and current Spectrum owners weren't really interested in a platform that wasn't backwards compatible and had no real software catalogue to speak of on the horizon. Production was suspended in 1985, citing a lack of demand, and as soon as the Sinclair acquisition deal was completed and saw Amstrad take over Sinclair's product lines and stock in April of 1986, the QL was officially cancelled. So was the QL a disaster of a machine, a victim of timing, a misconceived idea, a product that no one asked for, or all of the above? Well, I've personally never used one, but I did manage to get hold of this machine which was sold as a non-working unit, and I got it for a bit of a steal on that basis. I have huge plans for this machine, 
if I can get it working, as following my previous video on the Scion Series 5 and their wonderful software, I'm wondering if I can use this QL to effectively perform all of the business activities I have to accommodate to run the channel. I need a spreadsheet for production planning and looking after the money side of things. I need a word processor to scribble down the scripts, which I currently do on the Cambridge Z88 or my BBC Micro, and I need a database for the stock side of things, all tools that exist on this platform. I need to get it working of course, and there are several things that concern me, not least of which is this bunch of wires that are hanging around with no better place to be. I'd like to do away with the micro drives of course, and replace them with an SD card based solution, and I'd like to be able to get this machine online in some way, perhaps even as an email client. More memory would be nice of course, so I'll look into that also, and I'll be wanting to fully refurbish the machine so it looks brand new. So this is where I need your help. If anyone out there in Tinternet land can point me in the direction of some cool solutions to some of these problems, please let me know, either in the comments or by dropping me an email at shackofretro at gmail.com. The address is in the video description too. I'm looking forward to seeing what you all come up with and hopefully together we can give this machine a new lease of life in 2023, almost 40 years after it was built. It may even get more use now than it did at the time it first landed on someone's desk all those years ago, and we can give this machine a real redemption arc. Anyway, that's it for this little intro to the machine, and as always, thanks for watching, and until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.